Hi all. We're coming back after a big break. We basically revamped our shooting studio and we didn't have access to the recording setup and therefore the delay. And this is the first video we're doing in 2024. So wish you all a happy new year, though a belated one. What you're going to do is we're going to continue with where we stopped in 2023. We did two videos in 2023 December. One of the videos basically gave an introduction about table analysis and the second video followed it with an example of table analysis question. In this video, we're going to be looking at the next question type in data insights, which is two part analysis. We'll look at what is it, what kind of questions, what all could get tested in this? When will you earn credit for this? We'll look at the whole works in this video. I provided the links to the table analysis video. In case you have not watched it, you should watch it. And by the way, if you've not subscribed to our channel, I would request you to subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so they get notified about any important postings that we do. Let's get started. Data Insights has got five question types. Table analysis, two-part analysis, graphical interpretation, multi-source reasoning, and data sufficiency, which used to be a part of the quantitative reasoning section in the classic edition. Now it's a part of the DA section. Without much ado, let's get into two-part analysis. A two-part analysis question presents you with a brief scenario or a problem. It could be a quant question, it could be having a verbal flavor. We look at one such thing, what it could be. It could even have logical reasoning kind of a flavor, which is why I said it could present you with a brief scenario or a problem. And then it will be followed by two question prompts, which is why this is called a two part analysis. So for each of these questions, we'll have to find answers to two questions. And how does this work? They're essentially going to present you with five or six answer options. The answer options are going to be common to both these question prompts. We'll, when we look at in the next slide an example, you'll understand what I mean by that, right? So there are two question prompts and the answer options are common to both of them. What you need to do is you need to select an answer for one of the question prompts from these six options and a second one from one of these six, five or six options, right? Two things to keep in mind. One, each of these question prompts has got exactly one answer. It's not more than one answer correct as you would see in the case of a GRE, right? There are two question prompts, Q1, Q2. Q1 has only one correct answer. Q2 also has only one correct answer. You'll be picking them from these common five or six options. Right? You, there's no partial credit. You, there is only one correct answer for both the questions. And there's no partial credit. Unless you get both parts right, you're not going to earn credit for this. Right? For example, Q1, you answer it right. Q2, answer it incorrect. You're not going to get cre any credit for it, right? So this is the basis of it, right? Now let's take a look at a few examples. It'll help us understand what we talk about in this particular question type. Here's a very simple example. This is a quantitative reasoning flavored question. Number properties question is what I've chosen to help us quickly navigate through how this works. X is equal to 3,600. What is the highest power of two that can divide X without leaving a reminder? That is prompt number one. We'll call it as Q1. What is the highest power of three that can divide X without leaving a reminder? That's prompt number two, which is question two. How do we go about it? In the number properties, we will quickly prime factorize this number. 3,600, let's start by writing it as 36 times 100. Four into nine is 36. So two square times three square. Four into 25 is 100. So that is another two square times five square. So this basically boils down to two raised to a power of four times three square times five square. This is the prime factorized way of writing 3,600. What's the highest power of two that can divide this number without leaving any remainder? The highest power of two that we find in the number, which is a four. So for this part, this is, see there are common answer options, two, three, four, five, six. Question prompt one, what is the highest power of two? We have found it to be a four. What's the highest power of three is mentioned, it's written five, doesn't matter. Be it a five or a three, the answer is still the same. It's going to be a same two. So we have only one correct option for each of these columns, each of these question prompts. They come from a common set of options, which are basically this. In this question, we have basically five answer options. We'll look at one more example, right? Again, a quant flavored one. This time we're picking something from probability. A number is chosen at random from the first nine positive integers. So one, two, so on and so forth, up to nine. So this is the basic information given to us, the scenario presented to us. Two question prompts should be there. What is the probability that the number is a prime number? This is prompt one. And what is the probability that the number is a composite number? This is prompt two. And we have one, two, three, four, five answer options. Probability that it is prime, probability that it is composite is what you need to find out. In these first nine numbers, the prime numbers are two, three, five, and seven. 
1 to 9 is 9 numbers. 4 of these numbers are prime numbers. So probability that the number that you choose at random is a prime number is 4 upon 9. So that's an answer for this. Composite number. Leaving these 4 out, will the remaining 5 be composite? Looks like, but there is one thing which you need to watch out for. 1 is neither prime nor composite. So the composite numbers that we have in the set of first 9 numbers are basically 4, 6, 8 and 9. So 4 out of these 9 numbers are composite numbers. So if you select a number, the probability that it will be a composite number is 4 upon 9. So the answer is the same 4 upon 9 for both. Each of these columns will have only one answer. The same row can be the answer for both. So this is also a possibility. Don't expect to have the answers coming from different rows. The answers could be the same value for both as it happened in this case. Right? So these are quant questions which can be set as a two-part analysis question. Now, the couple of things about the two, uh, two different types of questions broadly that can come in two-part analysis. One is called related questions. The other is called independent ones. Let's look at what it is, right? Now, look at this example itself. To find the answer to this component, we use the information available here. First nine numbers, how many of them are prime? We got the answer. Now, if this question were not given to us, if this is not available to us, and only this part is available, and this data is there, would we have been able to find out the information for this? Yes, first nine numbers, there are four composite numbers. The probability is a four by nine. So finding answer to Q1 or Q2 was not dependent on one or the other. You could find an answer to this question based on this key data. You can find an answer to this from this key data. So essentially, both these parts drew information basically dependent on the first part of the information, key information, scenario presented to us. And each one was answered independently. Right. So one question type is basically that these two parts can be solved independently as it happened in the previous example. The second one is a case where the answer to one part is dependent on the value that you get for the second part. These are called related or paired ones. We'll look at an example for this as well to kind of understand what I mean by that. Quickly run through a couple of more examples, one for each, right? Look at this one. Two fair coins are tossed simultaneously. Two coins are tossed. What could be the outcomes? Head, 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 tail, tail, head, and then tail, tail. These are the outcomes that we have. What is the number of outcomes in which both coins turn heads? This is question one. And the ones in which none turns head, which is question two. How many outcomes do both turn heads? We have only one outcome. So this is the answer. None turns heads. How many outcomes do we have? That's like also one. Same row happens to be the answer for both these parts. It's absolutely fine. Could we have found the answer to this without this question? Yes. You toss a coin twice. We wrote the outcomes without knowing what the question was. So we could find the answer to the first question and the answer to the second question without one infringing upon the other, one depending on the other. So these are independent questions. Let's look at what is meant by a related question in this example. Merchant marks their goods up by 10% of her cost. Whatever is her cost, she's marking it up by 10% and selling it. Which of the following could be the profit made and which of the following could be the selling price? Again, we have six numbers. One of these six numbers should be chosen as a profit, which if it is 10% of the cost price, what could be the selling price is what we are trying to find out. How do you go about solving it? We'll do the math part of it and then select the answer subsequently and then see how one is related to the other. Well, typically, how would we go about it? If the cost is 100, let's say, 10% of the cost is a profit. So the selling price is going to be 110. Divide the entire thing by 10 to get a ratio of how this works. So 10 is to 1 is to 11 is the ratio of cost is to profit is to selling price. This question is a question, which of the following, not is, which of the following could be the profit and which of the following could be the selling price. Profit and selling price for a 10% profit on the cost will always be in the ratio of 1 is to 11. Profit if it is one part, selling price is going to be 11 parts. So it could be 1 rupee and 11 rupee. It could be $1 and $11. It could be $10 and $110. It could be $1,000 and $11,000. So any two numbers which are in the ratio of 1 is to 11 from this set will match this particular criteria. Obviously, the smaller numbers, look at this. These are 10 times kind of numbers. These are all the smaller numbers. 
so 40 36 44 are likely to be our possibilities for the profit now what we are going to do is going to pick each one of them and check out is there an answer among the other three which is 11 times this so if it is a 40 11 this is 10 times this is 9 times this is 440 so this could be your profit and this could be your selling price will it work with 36 36 times 11 is 396 we don't see it 44 times 11 is 440 plus 44 is 484 even that is not there so among the six numbers only one number fitted the class that it could be a profit and the other one is a selling price only one pair of values basically satisfied this 1 is to 11 condition they could have even given us an answer where it could have been a 50 and a 550 which would have worked so there is no one single answer which is a correct answer to match this 1 is to 11 criteria if one part is 40 11 parts will be 440 if one part is 50 11 parts will be 550 so they related to each other if this is a 40 then this will be a 440 this is a 50 this is going to be a 550 so the answer to one part is a function of the number that works for the other part these two are related to each other they go together so the value that you get here is going to be dependent on the value you get here and will influence the value that you get here this is what is called related or paired questions right so two part analysis questions could appear as independent questions where you can find each of these parts independent of the other or the value for one is a function of the value of the other this is called related questions right so these are all quant related questions which could be tested in the two part analysis question type you can also have verbal or reading based questions that could come here any passage with 50 to 100 words and questions based on this typically think of it as a modified version of the critical reasoning part that you are likely to see in the verbal Again, in this case also, you could get questions which are independent questions or related questions. Independent questions will essentially give you an example. A CR uh, argument is given to you and then there will be one part which will say which of the following strengthens the argument, which of the following weakens the argument. So essentially, you are going to strengthen it, weaken it, independent of each other based on the information available in the critical reasoning passage. The second one could basically be, they will give you some scenario and they will say, hey, which of the following if it is true, then you can infer something about it this way. Right? There's like possibly some information A, B, C given and then you plug in a D also into it. Only when you add this D to the picture can you infer the E. Right? So if D is true, then E is the inference that you draw. The other, for example, again they'll give you six statements, let's say. Only statement C and D will have this connect. The others will not. Or like B and D will have this connect. Some such two statements will have this connect. So they're related to each other. So even in the verbal flavored reading based uh, uh, two-part analysis questions, you can have independent questions, you can have related questions. You can also qu have questions which come from logical reasoning. What kind of questions can come? It can be basically an alphanumeric series. It could be a direction question, seating arrangement, blood relation, any other logical puzzle that you can set as a two-part analysis question. Questions can be related or questions can be independent. So this has given us a flavor of what to expect from the two-part analysis section. Relatively a easy one among the question types. If I have to kind of grade questions in order of difficulty, the first two would be basically data sufficiency and two-part analysis going hand in hand. The remaining three take more time th than these two types of question types. Right? We'll do another video where we'll do a sample question on two-part analysis, which is a little more difficult than the simple examples that we have looked at in this particular video. Best wishes for your GMAT preparation.